Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, where we're going to hear from God's Word, specifically through the Gospel, how Jesus, the living bread from heaven, uh, feeds the children of God, not only with uh, earthly, worldly things, but also spiritual things, leading us to eternal life with Him. That will be our focus for today. Our order of worship will be divine service setting one, just like we're used to, no changes to announce. So we will begin with our opening hymn, hymn 701. We'll stand when we sing the final verse. Be 
they asked and he brought quail and gave them bread from heaven in abundance. You open the rock and water shall shout. It flows through the desert like a river. For he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. So he brought his people out of joy. His chosen ones were singing. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. We'll give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. <coughs>
Old Testament reading for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold. I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you did not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll continue with the graduals in your bulletin insert verse by verse. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways! From Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. The epistle is from Romans chapter 9. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Continue by singing the Alleluia on page 156. Please stand. <laughs> Thank you. 
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you ever question anything you do in life? Like, why do we do this? What is the purpose of this? Well, I think it's good to, to do that occasionally, to provide some wisdom if possible. I mean, just for example, and specifically dealing with the lesson today. What is the point of a snack? Why do we eat snacks? I mean, is that snack going to provide all the sustenance and nutrients that we need? Well, no. No, it doesn't. A snack is nothing more than a little piece of food or a small serving of something to help hold us over until we get the main meal. It's to satisfy that little bit of hunger that we feel within until we can have the more sustenance meal. Well, in the gospel reading today, we hear Jesus provides a meal that leaves 5,000 men alone but then plus the women and the children, more than enough. Now, this meal that they received, as satisfying as it was, we'd be mistaken if we didn't realize that the meal Jesus just provided, the miracle that he did, was really just a snack. And that they would need more. This is important keep in mind, especially as we struggle through troubles in this fallen and sinful world. It would be good to ask ourselves, are we longing for and wanting mere snacks to provide immediate relief and satisfaction, or are we looking to Jesus and waiting for His ultimate relief and his ultimate provision. So we hear in the lesson today that the, the problem being addressed today isn't specifically in sin of broken commandments or humans' uh, rebellion or disobedience to God's created order. No, the focus today is the problems that we people struggle with in our world because the world itself has been ruined by the fall into sin. The world itself has become a harsh, harsh place to live. We hear Jesus withdrew in a boat to a desolate place by himself. When the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went to shore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, it's important to note that the text for today was immediately following John the Baptist's horrible death. If you remember, Herod had his head chopped off and served on a platter at a party. And it continues. They, they go out into the wilderness. And it, it continues with the, the fatigue of the disciples. And I think it's probably safe to say that this fatigue and sorrow was something Jesus himself experienced. And that's why he went away to be by himself. And it's his own human nature, his humanity, showed that he mourns this fallen, sinful world and the horrible things we have to suffer and endure as well. Now, the obvious effect of sin in the reading today is uh, the deficiencies. And specifically in the case today was the insufficient food for a crowd of people that had gathered around Jesus. Now just like anyone else, the disciples and the crowds, would have surely loved and desired Jesus to deal with the 
these effects of the empire, a mighty show of power, using his godly nature to, to make everything better. But in the state of humiliation, Jesus doesn't always use his divine power or act according to what we would typically like him to do. He does occasionally, but it's, it's only when applied to his work of salvation for sinners. If Jesus were just in the business of doing miracles to show his power, I mean, it would have been more impressive and more awesome to raise John from the dead, to put his head back on and bring him back to life, and then to strike Herod down in some terrible way that he probably deserved. That would have been a more powerful, awesome thing to do. That probably would have impressed the disciples and the crowd. Would have impressed anyone there. But it would not have shown Jesus to be the promised Savior. Power, for power's sake, is not the way of our salvation. And that's not to neglect that Jesus did in fact use his godly power to do the miracle of providing food for the great multitude. So why did he then use his power in that way rather than the, in the more glorious way that we would want? Well, his act of power in feeding the 5,000 was uh, an example of how he is the fulfillment of Old Testament promises and feedings. We're here in Exodus chapter 16, verses 3, 13 through 15. And in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 42 through 44, how God miraculously fed the people of Israel. So Jesus used his God nature to fulfill that. It was to point people to himself. But, like most of humanity, the crowd at that time didn't understand it. They didn't make the connection between the promise of our Savior and the fulfillment of that promise in Jesus. Sadly, the disciples didn't understand it either. They probably would have been more than satisfied to, to consider what Jesus was going to do about all of this mess rather than just the snack of the day which points them to the grave. So we see in the fall, our innocence, our ability to behave godly, wasn't the only thing that was lost. Our knowledge of God, our understanding of Him and who He is, was very, very clouded as well. Now, while a lot has changed from the time of the text, there are a lot of effects of the fall and living in a world ruined by sin that we share in. I mean, we too live in a world, especially now, where we hear of tragic, senseless, and violent death. People hating one another, murdering one another. We daily face physical and spiritual fatigue which makes us want to retreat, to isolate ourselves, to get away from this mess. And then that leads us to wonder, why doesn't God use his power to change all this? What is he waiting for? Why doesn't he strike these evil people dead? Why doesn't he bring justice? Well, that's not stopping to think that as sinners, we ourselves should be, in fact, struck first. I mean, it's not like we're not sinful. It's not like we're completely innocent. So see, we typically don't understand the 
state of humiliation of our Lord, or what we call the theology of the cross, or the study of God's mercy and His salvation, His love shown to us on the cross. But we often criticize other preachers for promoting it, about theology of glory, wanting God to do great miraculous wonders and works and signs. Well, that's what our sinful natures want as well. We naturally say within ourselves, give us free food. If you love me, God, give me a sign. Show me. And then I'll believe. If you just do this, if you just fix this, then I'll accept. All I need is a mirror. Just this one time. Show me. Or we can say, you know what? I'll take care of this matter myself. Just, just give me a little encouragement. Just give me a little motivation, a little bit of help, and I'll take it from there. I got it. I can do this. But you see, that's all a misunderstanding. That's seeing. That's not believing. That's not faith. That's not a trust relationship with Christ. That's settling for a mere snack immediate satisfaction and not waiting for the more important or much needed meal. As a result, we often see the same thing happening that happened shortly after this miracle. Many people, because they aren't satisfied, stop following Jesus. When they don't get what they want. Now that may be the case, but our Lord doesn't abandon us. He never abandoned humanity. He shared the sorrow of the people by mourning John's death. He saw the crowd and he had compassion on them. Instead of sending them away so he could mourn in private, he was deeply moved. We hear, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. When our Lord is deeply moved, when he acts out of compassion, he does great, miraculous things. He, in the text today, provides a short-term miracle by providing the food they need. But he does this all the time in our lives today by providing for our daily needs. I mean, in our world, is there anything you're specifically doing to keep yourself from getting sick? That is the Lord providing for our needs. Is there anything you're doing to keep breathing? I mean, Seriously, that is the Lord giving you every breath. And the long-term miracle that he points us all to would be his suffering and death on the cross to save and redeem sinners. Now this is one situation where Jesus would withdraw all by himself because no one can follow him or do that work. No one can save themselves. Only Jesus can save the sin. Far from raising John and striking Herod dead, Jesus actually gave more and more proof of how he would fulfill all that was written about the promised Savior. Jesus would suffer, he would die, and he would rise from the dead. Not only would he satisfy the, the hunger and the other needs of the crowd, a great meal, yeah, no doubt, but it was still just a snack for what was to truly fall. You know, keep this in mind. Jesus even paid for Herod's sin of having John the Baptist murdered. Keep that in mind. Herod would have repented and came to faith. He could have been saved as well. So you see, Jesus feeding 
5,000, he shows the same compassion that is to be shown in the greater miracle, the greatest meal of sinner's salvation on that cross. Now, because there is so much in common between us and the people of the text, the blessings of the gospel are the same for us also. If we can put ourselves in the crowd with respect to the problems, then we can surely put ourselves in the crowd with respect to the miracles as well. If the law shows us to be one of those who wants to see a miracle before we're convinced, if we naturally doubt like they did, if we hunger for immediate satisfaction more than we hunger for righteousness, if we fail to understand and often even take offense at the cross, that is, if we're willing to settle for snacks rather than a complete meal, well, there's good news for us also. For in Christ we are forgiven. So the big miracle, the real meal, is for you as well. The compassion Jesus has for all people which led him away from the crowds and to that very cross is for you. And the Holy Spirit convinces us of the truth that that word is for us. And you can be fully satisfied. And God's grace will overflow abundantly for you. Back then, Jesus looked up to heaven he said a blessing. And he did a miracle. So that people could live for a time. That was magnificent. Yeah, that was amazing. But it was a mere snack. Because they would get hungry again. They would get sick and struggle with this world again. But in light of the cross. In our world right here and now, today. Jesus looks down from heaven. He says a blessing. And he brings us into an ongoing miracle of salvation. A complete meal for all time and all eternity. And we hear Jesus say, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Sadly, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked. So Jesus said to his disciples, he says to you, do you want to go away as well? And we answer with Simon Peter saying, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed. We have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. At this time, I'd ask you to please stand as we join together and confess the Christian faith in the Nicene Creed on page 158. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, and in all things visible and invisible, and in all the Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, the God who is God before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God,
come without money and to receive grace beyond price. Hear us as we heed your call and turn to you in prayer, confident of your promise to hear and answer us. Father, we have sought meaning, comfort, and sustenance from all the wrong places. Grant us your Holy Spirit that our hearts may be turned to your word, that we may hunger for your Son's body and blood, and that we may discern truth from error. Lord, in your mercy, we are Father, we are daily blessed to know abundance and freedom. Bless those who defend us from our enemies, who serve us in government, and who protect us in our communities. Be with our president, the Congress, our governor, our judges, and our magistrates, that they may discern the right path and lead us with honor and integrity. Lord, give your mercy. Amen. Father, we suffer with all manner of ills and afflictions. Hear us. Grant to us healing according to your will, strength in the time of trial, and peace at the last. We pray especially for Pam, and for all our brothers and sisters at St. Paul requesting prayer. Good Lord, deliver us and teach us to, be, to depend upon your grace in all things. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we know that your steadfast love and mercy are forever. But our faith is daily tested and tempted. Give us strength and endurance that we may not despair but have confidence in more sufficient grace. Guide us to seek our consolation in your word and sacraments and prepare us to receive the Lord's body and blood in this holy communion. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we are daily and richly surrounded with your love and care. Grant us eyes to see your mercies new every morning and grateful hearts that what we have received we may share with those in need and generously support the work of your church. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, Father, we remember the saints who lived by mercy and died in Christ. We long for that day when all divisions will end and the church in heaven and earth shall be one in your presence, singing your praise in your kingdom without end. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, Father, we ask you to grant us all things needful and to keep from us all things harmful to us and to our salvation. For we trust your wisdom and your love. Teach us to pray without fear. Your will be done. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. We'll continue with the service of the sacrament on page 160.
heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you have created, and since your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With your tent of joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name of the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, upon earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after Saul by birth, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. This is as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins.
we got this morning. Uh, a couple of brief announcements first. We will have an elders meeting here tomorrow at 7 p.m. And then secondly, it looks like uh, Hope Circle is still not meeting at this point in time, but Ruth Circle will have their meeting on Tuesday at 6.30. If you're uncomfortable attending, let Nancy know and she'll get a Zoom invitation out to you so you can still join through uh, the internet. Then our Wednesday uh, Book of Revelation is still continuing. Again, that is also now changed to where it's Facebook live stream, so you can even just go to the church website on the Bible study, boom, it's right there. You can tune in that way. Um, and even if you wanted to get caught up or you know watch previous Bible studies that maybe you missed, they stay there, so you can go and watch them whenever you would like. Um, so that's available also. Then Friday, we have the diaper distribution from 5 to 7, and then Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon. That's pretty much all the announcements I think I have. Thank you again for coming, and feel free to greet one another.